This is the lab section for spinal cord and spinal nerves. This video will cover the cross section of the spinal cord. So remember when we talked about the spinal cord in lecture, we said that between each two vertebrae, there is a pair of nerves that come off. These are called spinal nerves. And if you remember that spinal nerves could be divided up into regions, just like the vertebrae themselves. We have the cervical region, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and coccygeal. Well, there are eight nerves in the cervical division, and they're numbered or named C1 to C8. There are 12 in the thoracic, T1 to T12. There are five in the lumbar, L1 to L5. And there are five in the sacral, S1 to S5. And then there's a single pair in the coccygeal region, and this is termed CO1. If we look at the cross section of the spinal cord, this is one of the models that we're going to use to look at. And this model is of the fifth cervical vertebra. So the fifth cervical vertebra, remember, all cervical vertebrae have transverse foramina. And if you look at this, near the body of the vertebra, you'll see arteries and veins. They're running through those transverse foramina. Those are the vertebral arteries. It's also very easy for us to tell anterior from posterior because the vertebra is here. If you take the spinal cord out of the vertebra, it looks like this, and it makes it much more difficult to see those things. But in lecture, we talked about other ways to tell anterior from posterior and we'll go over those again. So we're going to use these two models. And what we're going to do is sort of bounce back and forth between the two models as we look at the individual structures. So we're going to start with this model. And so if you look at it, remember the spinal cord has a lot of protections. First there's skin, and then there's connective tissue and muscle, and then there's bone. And then finally, there are three layers of membranes. And we'll see those membranes around the vertebra, I mean, around the spinal cord. But the vertebra themselves also have ligaments. And this isn't a ligament here. It's called the elastic ligament. Sometimes it's called the yellow ligament. Remember, elastin in the body is yellow in color. And so this ligament has a lot of elastin in it. This is not part of the spinal cord. This holds the vertebrae uh, in place and attaches them to each other. If you look just deep to that, what you're going to find is a layer of connective tissue, mostly fat. You'll also see some veins in there as well. But this sets on top of our first ver uh, membrane, and the first membrane that we're going to see is the dura mater. Well, this is on top of the dura mater, and so this is called the epidural space. So if you've ever had an epidural injection, or if you know someone who has, this is where the injection is placed. It's placed in this fat, and then anesthetics are fat-soluble, so they diffuse through the membranes, and then they numb up the spinal nerves. But then we get to the individual membranes. We want to be able to tell anterior from posterior. And so if you draw an imaginary line through here, right through the middle of everything, if you look on the left and you look on the right, you'll see a sort of a V. We want to be right in the middle of that V. If we follow it all the way through, we want to go right through the very center of the spinal cord. When we do that, we're going to create two sides and the upper side in this picture is the posterior side. The lower side is the anterior. Well, if you remember, that's easy for us when we look at it in a, a vertebral column because the spinous process is posterior. The body of the vertebra is anterior. So when we draw that line, we're going to be able to name basically everything based on whether it's posterior or anterior. We already looked at the elastic ligament and the epidural space. Well, if you just go deep to that, labeled number nine in this video or this model, what you'll see is the dura mater. So the dura mater is the thick, leathery outer layer of these three membranes that protect uh, the spinal cord. Right next to it, with almost no space in between, is the second one, and it's called the arachnoid. 
you'll see a little line that's drawn between these. That is supposed to be a space, but it's actually just sort of an imaginary space because these two membranes are pushed right up against each other. The third membrane touches the spinal cord, and that's the pia mater. So in this picture, you can see the three meninges, the dura mater, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. You'll also notice that there's a space between the arachnoid and the pia mater. That space is called the subarachnoid space, and it goes all the way around the spinal cord. That space contains cerebrospinal fluid. So take a look at these four things. Another thing we learned about was that the pia mater has these stabilizers which help hold the spinal cord in place. There's one at the bottom end of the spinal cord, which we'll talk about in another video. But there are also these which stick out almost like the teeth of a comb. And so the word tooth has dent in it. And so these are called the denticulate ligaments. And they're there to prevent the spinal cord from moving from side to side. You'll also notice there are indentions. And on the posterior side, the indention, right in the very center, is not very deep. So it's called a groove or a sulcus. So this is the posterior median sulcus. But if you look on the anterior side, this groove is much, much deeper. It goes all the way into the spinal cord. And it's not a groove, it's a fissure. So it's called the anterior median fissure. You can see the posterior median sulcus and the anterior median fissure on this model as well. We also know that there's gray matter in the middle of the spinal cord and the gray matter is shaped a lot like a butterfly. But instead of having wings, this butterfly has horns and there are three pairs of these horns. We have the posterior horns, which obviously are on the posterior side. We have the anterior horns, which are on the anterior side. And then we have the lateral horns, which project outward uh, to the sides. If you remember, the posterior horns are pointy and they go all the way to the surface. So this is another way to tell anterior from posterior. And you can see this on both models. They're pointy and they go all the way to the surface. If we look at the anterior horns, they're not. They're rounded and they don't make, reach the surface at all. And then the lateral horns project out to the side. This butterfly also has sort of a body, and the body goes from one side to the other. And when something goes from one side to the other, it's called a commissure. Well, this is made out of gray matter, so it's called the gray commissure. And then right in the middle, the very center of this gray commissure, the spinal cord is hollow. This hollow space goes up and down the entire length of the spinal cord. It's called the central canal. And the central canal, just like uh, the subarachnoid space, has cerebrospinal fluid in it. We also know there's white matter around the outside. And the white matter is divided up into sort of columns. And the Latin word for column is funiculus. And so we have these funiculi. There are two posterior funiculi. There are two anterior funiculi, and there are two lateral funiculi. Here in this picture, you can see all three pairs. Well, the funiculi, like this, are divided up into tracts. And we talked about tracks in lecture and what each one of them does. We kind of went over them, but here we're going to learn them for sure by name. But if you look at these funiculi, most of the funiculi have both ascending and descending tracks. In this diagram, ascending tracks are labeled blue and descending tracks are labeled red. Well, on the model, they're not there at all. You just kind of have to figure out where they are. And that's exactly the way it is in the spinal cord. There's no blue, there's no red, there's no labels. 
So rather than using the model, we're going to use a diagram to learn these tracks. And so let's look at these ascending and descending tracks. So in this picture, ascending tracks are blue and descending tracks are red. Let's look at the ascending ones first. The first ones we're going to look at are the, called the dorsal columns. And there's dorsal columns on either side of the spinal cord. Dorsal columns have two tracks. The medial one is called the fasciculus gracilis, and the lateral one is called the fasciculus cuneatus. Same thing on the other side. If you look on the lateral side of the spinal cord, you'll see a pair of tracks. These are called spinocerebellars. And there is a posterior spinocerebellar and an anterior spinocerebellar. That only leaves two tracks, and these two tracks are called spinothalamics. The larger of the two is the lateral spinothalamic and the smaller of the two is the anterior spine of the lamin. So go ahead and take a look at these and learn these. We're also going to learn the descending tracks. And again, in this picture, descending tracks are red. The first pair we're going to look at begin in the cortex of the brain. And so their name starts with cortico. So we have a lateral corticospinal and we have an anterior corticospinal on both sides. Near the lateral corticospinal, you'll see another large one. This is the rubrospinal. The third one in that group is the lateral reticulospinal. But there are two reticulospinals, a lateral and a medial. If we look at the anterior part of the spinal cord, you'll see a fairly large tract. This is called the vestibulospinal. And then the last one that we haven't mentioned is the tectospinal. So take some time to learn these as well. And then what I'd like you to do is look at the model and try to place all of these on the model. It won't be perfect, but you can kind of do it. Remember the spinal cord has spinal nerves attached. And there's a pair of spinal nerves that comes off between each two vertebrae. Remember this is cervical vertebra uh, five. And so this is going to be the fifth cervical nerve. And so if you look at it, the nerve is not this whole structure. It's only the structure where the circles are. If you look on the Outside of the circles, you'll see a dividing line. If you look on the inside of the circles, you'll see a dividing line. On this model, though, they only show the inside of this or the inside of, with the dividing line. The outside has been cut away. But inside these circles, those are the nerves. Well, if you move toward the spinal cord from the nerve, this split occurs and we get two roots. And so there's a dorsal root and there's a ventral root. If you get even closer to the spinal cord, they divide into further smaller divisions called rootlets. And so you can see these rootlets. If you look on the dorsal root, you'll see that it does not look like the ventral root. The dorsal root has this enlarged area. This is the dorsal root ganglion. And it gives us one other way to tell anterior from posterior, ventral from dorsal. If you look on the small model, you can see how there it is. And again, that's going to help us to decide that this is the dorsal or posterior side. As we talked about in lecture, the ganglion is where the cell bodies of sensory neurons are located. If you move away from the spinal cord toward on the nerve, you'll see that it splits again. But these aren't roots, these are rami. Ramus means branch. And there's a dorsal ramus and there's a ventral ramus. Well, when you look at these rami, again, they're not roots. 
They're branches of the nerve. The dorsal ramus goes to the structures of the back, the structures behind the spinal cord. That includes muscles and skin and so on. The ventral ramus, the ventral branch, goes to the structures anterior to the spinal cord. And so that includes everything in the front. That includes organs like the heart and lungs and the abdominal organs. It includes muscles. It includes skin. And there's a lot more structure in front of the spinal cord than there is behind. And so the ventral ramus is the bigger of the two rami. Here you can see the two rami, and you can see the split. If you look at the ventral ramus, something we see here that is not present on the dorsal ramus is there's a little bridge the bridge is a branch that communicates, so it's called the ramus communicans. If we look at it from another direction, there's our two rami, and there's the ramus communicans. And so it allows the nerve to communicate with these structures. These are called sympathetic chain ganglia. These are ganglia, they're cell bodies again, and they're in a chain that run up and down each side of the spinal cord. We'll talk about sympathetic chain ganglia when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. But you can see all those structures in this, in this picture. So that's the cross-section of the spinal cord.